welcome to the pre-worship experience. It's now known as The Scene. Good morning. Welcome to the scene. We are so excited to be here. I feel like the weather's breaking. God is blessing. I am Derek Carr, the son of St. Stephen's, and I am with my beautiful sister and friend. We are celebrating women all month long. It is International Women's Month, and we are celebrating all the accomplishments that the women have done for us. We would not be who we are if it was not for them. Amen. 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 And actually, during this month, the scene celebrates four years. Yay! Four Woo! years. <laughs> the scene was birthed actually during woman, Women's Month, actually on Women's Day when we did our very first scene broadcast. And so we're so excited for all the wonderful things that God has allowed us to do on this platform. Yeah. And today is going to be really, really good. Hey, since it is Women's Month, I want to just go ahead and shout her out. Uh, Betty Baye, someone who I have looked up to and admired. She is being inducted into the Kentucky Journalism Hall of Fame. Wow. And the ceremony is going to be on Tuesday, April 9th at UK. If you can make it, go ahead and show your face. But we love our Betty, and so we're going to get her on the scene to talk all about her history uh, coming up here soon. All right, Mr. Derek Carr. Yeah. I am delivered. Are you delivered? (laughs) I am delivered. (laughs) Delivered. All right, we have got a special treat for you today, Actors Theater of Louisville, with the executive director, Robert Barry Fleming. Playwright Jonathan Norton. These are our special guests. uh, I was going to call you Dr. (laughs) Robert Barry Fleming of Actors Theater of Louisville, everybody. Show him some love. And playwright Jonathan Norton. Everybody show Jonathan Norton some love. And I know it's a little chaos. The 8 o'clock service just wrapped. And so if you're coming in, we thank you so much for joining us on the scene, your jump start for worship. So we are talking about this play, Dr. Flint, well, Mr. Robert Barry Fleming. <laughs> thank you so much, first off, for joining us. Tell us all about this play, I Am Delivered, the world premiere. Well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us as guests. Uh, thank Dr. Cosby. Uh, and congratulations, Betty. Uh, Jonathan Norton uh, came in 2019, did one of our um, apprentice shows and uh, kind of blew us away and offered at that time, I have this idea about a play in the black church with usher boards. Ooh. Oh, yeah. And, um, and, and, and queer people. Yeah. And I, I said, that sounds really interesting, Jonathan. <laughs> Cut to four years later, we get the opportunity to see this extraordinary comedy that is um, just about love, about community. Uh, We had the pleasure of hearing the end of the 8 o'clock service and the idea of people coming back to the church, uh, the attempt to erase us from uh, the very place that um, continues to feed us in a mutually Mm -hmm. beneficial way. Queer people have always been in the church. They always Mm -hmm. will be in the church. They've always been the foundation, like black people, intersecting communities. Um, And the pretense of us not being present, um, it continues to be lead us to having somebody with that many felonies leading in a presidential race. The destruction of our democracy and destruction of our spiritual fitness and wellness when we choose um, to participate in this caste system where, you know, through, through all of the things that brought us to this continent, mm-hmm. um, getting a chance to really see what flourishing is. But doing that with love and humor, um, nobody does that like Jonathan Norton. Yes. And if you, if you think Tyler Perry's funny, you hadn't heard Jonathan's work. If you think 
Uh, Ava DuVernay can touch your heart yes. with a gorgeous work like Origin. You still haven't seen Jonathan's work. This man's a prophet, and we have been graced to bring this beautiful play about usher boys <laughs> in the black church. <laughs> it's our story, and it is um, it's glorious. And we'll be start. We just started tech. We've got this glorious company of artists, um, beautiful artists like Liz M Michael, E. Faye Butler, legends in our theater uh, community in, in this uh, great country sharing the work. This is going to be so wonderful. Uh, real quick, we thank everybody for joining us here on the Scene Alive show is in progress. So if you could please give our guest uh, courtesy and uh, please keep it down here in the sanctuary. All right, let's go ahead and set the scene for the play. It's Good Friday at the New Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church. The seven last word service is in full swing. So Mr. Jonathan Norton, take it over. Over. Talk to us about the vision of this play. Um, the Is it on? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I always have that awkward moment with mics and like, is this on? Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, I Am Delivered uh -huh. is, uh, for me, uh, at its core, um, just... There you go. Is it going in and out? I Am Delivered. There oh, I see. Go. Sorry, yeah. So I Am Delivered for me at its core is a love story, a mm -hmm. love letter uh, first to the black church. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor was speaking earlier about, um, about ends and finding an end and yeah. needing an end, yeah. you know? And, and for me, you know, the, the black church and the black church experience for our people um, is like the first major and significant institution yeah. uh, within the African American community. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and within that, um, it's been a home for, for all of our people, um, regardless, in many ways, regardless of sexuality mm -hmm. or differences in various types of ways. Although there's also that whole thing, like, don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, and so with this play, I really wanted to find a way to make, um, to make visible the invisible, mm -hmm. because there are folks who sit um, in our pews every Sunday and who um, believe with their whole heart and are completely faithful um, and faithful stewards yeah. of our churches, um, but they oftentimes don't have the opportunity yeah. um, to, to see themselves mm -hmm. represented uh, fully. And in theater, we have that opportunity to do that and maybe in a way that might be difficult for the church, but hopefully the work that we do in the theater can uh, provide opportunities in the church for, um, for greater conversation or expanded conversation, like a little bit of med like a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down, <laughs> like that kind of thing. So. Right, but that's the power of the arts. Yeah. You can talk about those type of topics and basically express it through your work. And so, I am delivered. It was first premiered. It was first commissioned by the Dallas Theater Center, right. and so now it's found its way here to Louisville. Encourage our, uh, you know, our audience, our congregation. Why should they come out and support this this play? They should come out uh, if they want to have a good time at the theater, uh, laugh, cry, but also um, be uh, provoked yeah. uh, to conversation. Um, I'd also say that um, they should come out if, if there's, um, if you've ever had that sense within the church mm -hmm. that there is something that, that you know, that idea of church hurt yeah. that all folks yeah. deal with, it has nothing to do with, with one's sexuality. Mm -hmm. Church hurt can exist for any number of reasons. Right. I remember for, for my family, uh, my parents were both ushers. Mm -hmm. They were both on usher board. <laughs> so that's where it all comes from for the play for me. They're all on usher <laughs> yep, board. One and two. <laughs> all right. Usher board. We didn't care about usher board number two. <laughs> nuh uh No. Because see, usher board number two... At my church was like the singles, young adult uh, support. Oh, got you, got you. And my parents always said, like, they were like, oh, no, uh, -uh. they just here to look cute. <laughs> <laughs> they just here to find a husband, to find a wife. <laughs> 
They ain't trying to do no ushering. And so when folks would get happy and to get the Holy Ghost, right. they were good for nothing. <laughs> and, so, and so usher board number one, all, even though it wasn't their, uh, their Sunday to usher, they had to like jump up anyway and yeah, like yeah. help take care of folks. That's um, awesome. But yeah. So um, what I just saw was the humor in it. So <laughs> I, just, I just saw that when he, when he said that earlier. Um, so... What got you into playwrights? What, what, what made you want to even do this, to even be a part of this? Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was in a production of, of Joe Turner's Coming Gone mm. by August Wilson, like the great August Wilson. And uh, just uh, being 15 and having that opportunity at such a young age to speak that language yeah. and to... Uh, to sit backstage, you know, during the shows and listen to the show on the monitor and just hear that language and that poetry. Eight, eight shows a week for like five weeks. Mm. It just had a huge impact on me. And uh, during the show, backstage, I started writing scenes yeah. and monologues and I would, ca I would like cast the actors in the show to read stuff for me. And later on, one of my mentors, Vicki Washington, who you know, would joke uh, about eventually they got to the point where they would just hide in their dressing room. Mm -hmm. Like, hide, hide, he got paper. He's coming. Run, hide. Because I would just <laughs> cast him and stuff. Uh, and then I went to a high school, performing arts high school, uh, that had a playwriting uh, program. And it kind of began to blossom from there. Wonderful. Right. And so I Am Delivered is going to be running March 13th through the 24th at Actors Theater of Louisville. Uh, how can people get tickets? Uh, Actorstheater.org. Just go right to that website and uh, you can get your tickets. Um, and uh, we have uh, some special uh, gifts uh, for you all to Ooh. come to a celebration for yes. opening night, uh, March 15th. Okay. Uh, with a big announcement about uh, Actors Theater and uh, the American Theater. Oh, that is so yeah. exciting. Mr. Robert Barry Fleming, you are known all over the world. What part of I Am Delivered really sticks out to you? What's your favorite part? Uh, I, I think I just love how it lives in abundance, mm -hmm. in love. Um, it does not reduce love to a feeling, yeah. but the action that we all must take That's right. um, in truth telling yeah. in the face of uh, uh, all of this polarizing, distorted yeah. dog whistle yeah. politics and mm -hmm. theatrics that are happening in this country, destroying mm -hmm. everything that we built Yes, uh, and did not get <laughs> and, and the lack of accountability that mm -hmm. we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Dr. Cosby for me is one of our great leaders yes. uh, in truth telling and authenticity. Absolutely. And um, understanding that the spirit and the political and the way that we uplift our people and give, our, give honor mm -hmm. to our people and our dignity in spite of people actively, yes. repeatedly, and boldly trying to make sure that we understand our second-class second citizenship, mm. third-class citizenship, yeah. citizenship in a country that we build. Uh, as a black queer uh, senior, mm -hmm. uh, just had my 60th birthday. What? I'm, yeah. I'm, I am so uh, inspired yeah. by the work of uh, our ancestors, folks like my dad who worked at K-State, mm -hmm. uh, worked in institutions as my mother did that were about uplifting our people and, uh, and truth-telling. And, Truth and taking yeah. space yeah. when taking people a... want you to take a smaller space. Yeah. It's like, I'm, we ain't smaller. Yeah. That, there's yeah. no biological, genetic, or cultural narrative that supports us being anything less than um, con as connected to God as King Charles thinks he's connected to God. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jonathan's work, the work of art, continues to give us the opportunity to reify that, mm -hmm. uh, shout that loud and proud, mm -hmm. endure the interruptions and the mm -hmm. bumps and be that tire that is absorbing the, the uh, attempts to continue to keep us in our place when God has already told us what come our on. place is. Amen. Our place amen, amen. Is, 
equal to anybody on That's this planet. Right. Amen. Well, listen, uh, the thing I love about this church is that everybody, everybody. is welcome here that is at St. Right. Stephen Baptist Amen. Church. And you can Amen. be who you are unapologetically. Absolutely. Well, make sure you get your tickets today. I am delivered. And you can also get uh, tickets online, right? Actors you can Theater, get tickets Louisville. Online. Actors Theater is a place of belonging for all citizens, mm -hmm. and you will not be curated in proximity to your whiteness, your heteronormativity, your maleness. You are welcome fully to be yourself at Actors Theater of Louisville. We are creating a welcoming space for everybody of every social location. Amen. Amen. Everybody Come show some out. love for Robert Barry Fleming. And playwright Jonathan Norton. Thank you all so much. You. It's Thank always you. a pleasure to see you. Hey, real quick, we're going to do a pew, pew check. check. check now, the up. name of this play was I Am Delivered. Why don't you, uh, what are you delivered from? What has God delivered you from? And maybe you gave up something during Lent. Uh, I know you was uh, doing a Daniel Fast for I a little still, bit. And I did Lent, too. I yeah. Continued. I yes. Continued. You know, no sweets, no meat. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Yeah, we working, so, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's going to go down there and do a quick pew check. And then our special next guest, you've heard all about this phenomenal group all, wing, all week long. They are the real life superheroes, and that's coming up here in a bit. But real quick, Mr. Derek Carr. So I have a phenomenal woman. Um, this is, tell me your name. Catrice McLean. And she is also the wife of? DeSantos McLean. And she has, um, we know DeSantos a couple years ago suffered from a stroke. And um, Catrice is a wife, a mother, her two beautiful children, and a caregiver. Yeah. So tell us about that. Uh, it is a process from day to day. It has drawn me closer to the Lord. Yeah. Um, one thing that I do know is that God gives me his strength, and I can depend on him for everything. And in all of that, I know there's a tremendous blessing because I don't look like what Come I Come on. Do. Yes. Man. And I, I grabbed you purposely because I understand caregiving. My baby's here today. My mama. Yes. And we know that caregiving is not always the easiest thing. So I just wanted to give you your flowers publicly because I know it's not easy. But I know I see you keep going and you smiling and you praising and you doing all those things. So I'm going to say it. For me and my brother, we love you. And keep Aww. doing what you do. Hey, Amen. And that lady can sing. You oh, hear yeah. me? Woo. We, I missed out on that note she hit the other Sunday. <laughs> All right, you all, we have got a very special guest with us again. We brought you uh, him back in December. But everybody, show some love for Louisville's finest, Lieutenant Colonel Assistant Chief Clarence Gamble of the Louisville Fire Department. We are calling what took place last Friday, Miracle on 2nd Street, and that was your crew that was responsible for the rescue of that woman that was trapped in that semi-truck. Wow. And let me just break it down like this. This man right here is overtraining. He's the one that instituted the training for these firefighters that pulled off that miraculous rescue. Let's show some love again. He's our very own. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me again. All right. So uh, I know it has been a whirlwind for you and your department. What have things been like since uh, last Friday? Uh, it feels it's been like we're on the national stage. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it basically felt like a movie. Yeah. Because that was. It looked like one, too. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that's. That's the, if, that's the thing that we just like, okay, this, what are we going to do if? Mm -hmm. And when I pulled up on the scene, I was like, oh, this is the if. Wow. And it was, wow. It was a, yeah. Wow. A whole lot of praying was going on. on I, I, I know that's right. Real quick, uh, take us through the scene, though, because I had an opportunity to interview uh, Mr. Bryce Carden, and he was telling me the story. They were at, you guys were actually at the store when the call came in, but miraculously, you appeared at the scene in just three minutes. So the company that was handling the rope operation, it's our 
they're based out of headquarters. Mm -hmm. They're also our dive team. So part of them were literally right down the street here at training. The others were at Kroger, where we do go every day, Yeah. Um, when the call came in. So the company that's downtown, which is on the other side of Jefferson, they were the first ones on the scene. Yeah. And so they started assessing and was relaying information to us as we were all getting on the scene, what we had. So when they, of course, you, we all got the, what we call the knockout, mm -hmm. that there's a car over the bridge. We're like, okay, somebody didn't call in another prank. But when the first call company got on the scene and they were like, we have a semi that's hanging Jesus. over the ledge, everybody was like, oh, we're going to have to work. <laughs> 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 and to see the, the truck hanging there, I, I was like, oh, boy, this is, this is for real. It, it, it wasn't just hanging, as all of the media outlets have used the phrase dangling. dangling. It yes. was dangling yes. from the bridge. It was, there was a piece of the truck no bigger than this table that was lodged in the framework yeah. of the bridge. That was the only thing. Wow. Holding that truck. Oh my God. And yes, exactly. You just it was God. Yeah. God now, was holding that truck up. When, when I saw that, the first thing on Facebook, because you know that's the real news now. Right. So right. <laughs> yes. You see that first. So it was like, what is going on? People were going live. It was crazy. And somebody said, this looks like a job for Spider Man. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you said that it was like a movie, I could only imagine seeing that up close. What, what well, was that it, like? We literally, we all were like, where is Spider Man coming <laughs> out from now? <laughs> That has, that has been the running comment. Um, it, it, was, it was more like everybody just knew what their place was. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing and the greatest thing about the fire department is we all know what we can do. Mm -hmm. We know our limitations, and we're not afraid of that. So we literally had each, each guy that was on the scene had a specific job they were supposed to be doing, and they didn't. They did it flawlessly. It, they made it look like a movie scene. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, everybody was like, okay, this is, we have got to do what we've got to do to get her out. Yeah, it was go time, and you, yes. your guys executed what they had been trained to do yes. for years. Yes. Talk about the training uh, that you guys endured to be able to pull off rescues just like that so we normally on a yearly basis we we have to do keep up 300 three to four hundred hours of training mm -hmm. so our specialty companies on top of that they have to keep up training hours for their specialties that they're in these guys it's nothing to, to be walking through the bay at their at their firehouse and they've got the ropes out and they've got systems set up and they've they've gone through scenarios in their head what are we going to do if? And so that one was very unique. What was the technique? Uh, you told me the technique that that was called. That's, it's a low angle rescue. Uh -huh. And there's not many places you can train to do that because of how, how dangerous of a situation yeah. it is. So especially like our trucks, that ladder that was sticking out, that is very technical mm -hmm. and there was what we have is called a tip load. So you can only have so much weight yeah. on the tip of the ladder at certain degrees without the truck tipping over. Wow. So, so the rope that was, the rope that Bryce was, uh, you know, attached pushed to. down, was attached to, was attached to the. To the tip of the ladder. Wow. wow. Tip of the ladder. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And that's tip normally not done. Yeah. Because of the tip load. But we. It was like, just, we got to get it done. Wow. So Bryce was Spider-Man. Yes, he, he was. He, he yes. really was Spider-Man. Yes. Yes. My question, I'm sorry. To, no, my no, question no. is, what was, you know, and we had an opportunity to speak with Bryce, but uh, I think the thing that really resonates with us was how calm the woman was yes. that you all rescued, though. Talk about that moment, though, because, you know, she's, you know, we're respecting her privacy. She doesn't want to uh, talk to the media right. right now. But what can you tell us about those moments? Well, I, when I first got there, 
I yelled down to her, asked her if she was okay. She's like, I'm not hurt. I just need out of here. Yeah. And I said, we get, we're, we're coming, but you've got to maintain calm yeah. and patience because what we're about to do is going to take some time to get set up. So the fact that we got her, in theory, it was 40 minutes. Yeah. But once the rescue company that did the ropes, once they got there, it was literally 20 minutes. And our our general time frame usually is, is an hour is what we, for for some type of technical rescue. That so was God. We, yes. Oh, it was oh, God. Oh, that was such. Oh, it was oh. good. Yeah. Dear. I just want to say, man, God bless you. Thank God you. bless your efforts, what you're doing. Just thank you for just being our Spider-Man. Yes. <laughs> teaching us, I mean, just doing so much. It was just on a national stage. It was absolutely amazing. And just hats off to the Louisville Fire Department and thank what you. you all done, the training you're doing. You had to be super proud. Oh, you no, had yes. to be super proud. Oh, so. it, it, my wife and I were at a friend's anniversary party and literally – I walked in and everybody was like, <laughs> Uncle, tell me about it. Tell me about right. it. And I was just like, so yes, it, it's very, I am very proud of the guys because they, they did an absolutely fabulous job. And now, now we've been teasing Bryce because he is Mr. Mr. He's, Hollywood, I mean, yes, right? Yes, Hollywood, yes. Right, so is all the media say he did Good Morning America. Yes. What are the other outlets? He's done good. He did all the, all the local stations uh -huh. here. Um, Headline News, wow. CNN, wow. Um, he, which he went to that school up in Lexington for a basketball game. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Did, yeah. yes, with yeah. Coach Calipari. Yeah. I heard that he got a chance he, to go to the U.K. Yeah, game. Yeah, he did. Yeah. So but, I gave him grief over that. Right. But before we go, though, I really wanted to drive home that you are the assistant chief and you are over the training y'all and he is a member here of our Thank church Jesus. he is yeah. our very own yes you know what is it what can the community do to continue to support you all while you guys are doing the life-saving work that you're doing what message do you have for the community just continue to love us yeah and when you see us get out of the way yeah <laughs> <laughs> get out the way um <laughs> we love this community. We'll do anything and everything we can for it. And it's been, it's been a great career for me. Yeah. And I encourage anybody who needs a career, come on out. We're getting ready to start taking applications for a new class start, that will start next year. So. Well, give the website real yeah, quick. LouisvilleKY.gov. Go to the fire department page and click Become a Firefighter. All right. Well, we've got to get out of here, but I am not going to let you go without letting Mr. Derek Carr. And we hope that all the members uh, that are here in the sanctuary extend your hand to Lieutenant Gamble. Why don't you lead us with the, in a word of prayer? Father God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We ask that you continue to cover our Louisville Fire Department and all that they do, God. Every every effort they do, every time they go out to a fire, let them save, continue to bless. And God, if you could just guide and keep them like only you can. Now, God, if you would dwell in the midst of this service, thank you for what you're about to do. Bless this choir. Bless our pastor to say a rhema, an awesome word for us today. If anybody needs anything from you, let them get it in the name of Jesus. Any situation that's not of you, we ask that you remove it right now in the name of Jesus so we can focus on you. Focus on your goodness, on your grace, and on your mercy. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. And it's all these things this day. Amen. 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 Let's get ready for worship. Hello, I'm Tia Mir, co-lead and spokeswoman for Women's Month at the Indiana campus. And I am Brandy Mir, also co-lead and spokeswoman for Women's Month on the Indiana campus. We're excited about this year's Women's Month and especially Women's Day. Our Women's Month theme is Embrace the Essence, Women Living Empowered Lives, Celebrating Strength, Wisdom, and Inner Radiance. And our scripture is Luke 145, which says, Blessed is she who believes that the Lord has fulfilled his promises to her. The ladies will be attending the Women's Conference and Awards Ceremony on Saturday, March 16th, and we will be selling tickets at the Indiana campus for $25. Tickets are also available on ssclive.org. We are also looking forward to the Women's Day celebration and recognition service here on the Indiana campus on Sunday, March 17th, with special guest speaker Reverend R. Janae Pitts Murdoch of Light of the World Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. Our color theme is shades of blue, and women are encouraged to give $150 above your tithes and offering. 
Of course, men, we also are asking for you to donate in honor of your wife, mother, or any special woman in your life. So ladies, come join us for a month full of excellence, empowerment, and enjoyment in God and for His glory. We look forward to seeing you on Women's Day. I Am Delivered, the I Am Delivered world premiere, written by Jonathan Norton, directed by Robert Barry Fleming, produced in association with the Dallas Theater Center in the Pamela Brown Auditorium at Actors Theater of Louisville, will take place on March 13th through the 24th. Tickets are available at actorstheater.org. We're kicking off Easter weekend at the Stephen, Friday, March 29th, 11 a.m. It's going to be our Good Friday service. Seven last words. Maddie's Kitchen will also be available after service every Friday during Lent from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. And be sure to join us for worship on Easter Sunday, and that's Sunday, March 31st, across all of our campuses. Kingdom Kids will host a Resurrection Sunday School event, and there will be activities for the kids. Our missions and outreach ministry have upcoming opportunities for you to serve. Join us Saturday, March 30th from noon to 2 p.m. Join us to pray and serve food to those that are in need at First and Broadway. Monday, April 1st, we're going to be doing diaper donations for babies and toddlers. And you can drop off those donations at the Family Life Center. For more information and all other volunteer opportunities, contact Steve Shaw at sshaw at ssclive.org or Elena Middleton at amiddleton at ssclive.org. We're celebrating our hard workers, our volunteers, here at the Stephen. Join us on Saturday, April 6th from 12 to 3 p.m. for a cookout on our Louisville campus. On our Indiana campus, we're going to be serving up breakfast, and that'll be on Sunday, April 7th, immediately following service. And we're doing dinner on our Hardin County campus. Sunday, April 14th, also immediately following service. Now, this gathering does require a reservation, so to reserve your slot, simply visit sscline.org. to look now at the vital role women, both black and white, played in the civil rights movement. When it comes to black history, we know all about Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Phyllis Wheatley, and even Rosa Parks. But what about Ella Baker, Dorothy Bates, Ann Braden, and others? These women represent the hundreds of women who came forth to do her own part, big and small, and who represent the hundreds of women who formed the mass movement that made the difference. It was not yet three years old when the Civil War ended and slavery was abolished. So she had no personal money of being, from being enslaved. But she heard her parents' stories and saw the scars on her mother's back from beating she had suffered. Slavery was a stark reality for Ida, but her own personal childhood was spent in and shaped by Reconstruction. From 1865 to 1877, the federal government established the ground rules for Southern states' readmission to the Union, and federal troops kept order in the South. Black Americans gained freedom, citizenship, and the right to vote during these years. They also contended with fear, poverty, 
and the sometimes violent hostility of many whites. Ida grew up in Holly Springs, Mississippi, the oldest of eight children. Her parents, James and Elizabeth Wells, learned to read after slavery and made sure their children were educated. James had been trained as a carpenter and was able to support his family without becoming a sharecropper, the fate that kept so many blacks in conditions similar to slavery. He was self-sufficient, determined, and proud. When his former owner's mother asked him to visit, he refused. In 1867, when black men in Mississippi could vote for the first time, his white employer told him to vote for the Democrats, but again, he refused. When Ida was 16, her family faced a terrible tragedy when her parents and baby brother died of yellow fever. The six remaining Wells children were orphaned, and Ida suddenly found myself head of a family. She went to work as a school teacher. She also continued her own studies, taught Sunday school, and did the family's cooking, washing, and ironing. Three years later in 1881, Ida and her two youngest sisters moved 50 miles away to Memphis, Tennessee to live with her aunt, where Ida continued to teach. The South was changing. Reconstruction was over. A harsh new system called Jim Crow was gradually constricting black people's rights and freedoms and enforcing segregation, often through intimidation and violence. Jim Crow was eventually written into the law, but most of it was based on social customs and the whims of individuals, as Ida learned. When she was 22, Ida bought a first-class ticket on a train from Memphis to Holly Springs and took a seat in the ladies' car, something she had done for the previous two years. This time, however, the conductor asked her to move. Ida resisted, and when he tried to drag her from her seat, she bit his hand. Two men helped him forcibly remove her as a white passengers applauded. After she was removed from the train, she sued the railroad for damages and won. But her triumph was short-lived as the railroad won on appeal. Jim Crow was becoming the law of the land. In 1886, when she was 14, excuse me, 24, Ida lost her teaching job after she criticized conditions in the Memphis schools. She had written a few articles for newspapers and decided to turn turn to journalism full-time. Three years later, she bought a share in the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight and was appointed its editor. She was the first female co-owner and editor of a black newspaper in the U.S. She began writing articles and editorials under the name Iola. The major turning point in Ida's life came in 1892. Her friend Thomas Moss, a Memphis letter carrier and grocer, was lynched by a mob after confrontations with rival white grocers. Shocked, Ida bought a pistol and wrote an editorial urging African Americans to move out of Memphis for their safety. Then she began to focus on her work on the the rise of lynchings in America. By the 1890s, lynching was a terrorist campaign to solidify white control of the South. Victims were often black men accused of raping white women. Ida doubted these accusations, noting that often the charge was made after a man had been hanged or burned or shot or beaten. She thought it more likely that victims had been in a consensual relationship with a white woman or, like her friend Thomas Moss, were businessmen who threatened rival whites and had no connection to white women at all. Ida wrote a series of anti-lynching editorials. The last one suggested that white women could, not, could find black men romantically appealing. And she headed north for three weeks as it hit the newsstands. Editors of white newspapers in the South reprinted the editorial and called for white men to avenge their women. While she was in New York, Ida learned of threats against her and against her friends and family. The officers of her newspaper, the were burned. It was clear that she could not return to Memphis. From then on, she lived in the North, mostly in Chicago, and changed her pen name to Exiled. Ida documented 728 lynching cases that had occurred between 1884 and 1892, using research by the Chicago Tribune. Within months of her friend's murder, she wrote a collection of articles under the title Southern Horrors. She focused on less less on grisly details and more on the false accusation made against the victims. Her goal was to arouse the conscience of America, and she became America's best-known crusader against lynching. Ida was also a staunch supporter of women securing the right to vote. She published how enfranchisement stops lynching. 
in Original Rights Magazine in 1910, showing that when black voters in Illinois elected a black state legislator in 1904, he worked to pass a law against mob violence. She co-founded the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago in 1913, which became the largest black women's suffrage organization in Illinois. In addition to supporting women's efforts to obtain the vote, the Alpha Suffrage Club taught women how to be politically active and promoted black candidates for office. Ida marched in the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, D.C., when many of the organizers resisted black women's participation in the parade. After black women were told they would be marched in segregated sections, the NAACP organized letter and telegram protests. The, par the parade organizers relented and black suffragists, including Ida, marched in their state and occupational delegations. She continued her work for decades, traveling abroad to decry lynching and raise money and working with women's clubs to encourage political participation, even running for state office herself. In 1922, she supported an anti-lynching bill then before Congress. Because of democratic opposition, the bill failed as did all efforts federal efforts to end lynching, white supremacy's weapon of terror. In 2018, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice opened in Montgomery, Alabama to commemorate more than 4,400 African American men, women, and children lynched between 1877 and 1950. In 2020, Ida was awarded a posthumous Pulitzer Prize in recognition of her outstanding and courageous report reporting about lynching. This, this is, is Ida, Ida B. Wells, Wells and, and the, the Power, power of, of Women. women. <laughs> praise the Lord, everyone. Come on, stand to your feet and give God great praise in here. For this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Can we welcome those who are watching online? Just come on, give your praise for them watching online. If you're watching from any other campus, this is communion, Holy Communion Sunday, so go ahead and get your sacraments because we'll be referencing that here shortly. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I come to praise the Lord. The Bible says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So let's do it. If you're looking at me, come on, let's go choir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. We're going to do it together. We're going to sing Psalms 117 together as we install it. We give God great praise this morning because he has done great things for us. Come on, everybody, sing it with us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All ye people. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, everybody. Red, yellow, black, and white. We owe him praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We came to clap our hands. If you feel like running, show some signs that you want to give him glory this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Childress, and I'll be doing scripture and prayer today. Our scripture is coming from Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 8. But because of his great love for us, uh oh, sorry, y'all. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, see. But I can see that. Okay. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. In order that in coming ages he might show us the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Okay. Okay. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day's journey. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy which you freely give to us every day. Because of your grace and mercy, we have everything we need. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Make our hearts and minds ready and receptive to receive the word that you have given our pastor to give to us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord for his word. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our deacons are coming, as we prepare to take communion or receive communion today, we do it because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you do it, you remember my sacrifice and all that he did for us. Amen. Amen. And when, the, when Jesus was at the table, he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and he said, take and eat. This is my body. Let us eat together. And then in like manner, he took the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink together. 
And when they departed to the Mount of Olives, they left singing a hymn. What did they sing? At the cross. Oh, it was there. St. Stephen, <laughs> and good morning, women, and happy Women's Month to us. <laughs> my name is Roshana Daniel, and I rise to welcome my guests and visitors today. I would li like to acknowledge our Girl Scout, our own St. Stephen's Girl, Girl Scout Troop 1300, under the direction of Sister Lisa Love. They are here today representing their troop and in spirit, and they are also selling Girl Scout cookies out in the lobby. So if you would, if I could have you all just stand real quick. Thank you all so much. 
these girls do a lot in the community. They do a lot at the church. So their Girl Scout cookie sales help to fund a lot of what they do. So if you all could, after service, go out to the vestibule and support them and purchase some cookies. Um, I would also like to welcome our online guests and visitors. If you are online with us, we welcome you to the sanctuary today. We are so glad to have you on the behalf of our pastor, Reverend Cosby, and Sister Barnetta Cosby. We welcome you into the sanctuary, into the service. If you're online, just give us a love offering, a wave, a emoji, kissies, faces, or whatever, just to let us know that you're out there in social media world. Also, we have another special guest. We have uh, Brother Joshua Watkins, who is a Democrat for State Representative District 42. If you could stand. We will continually pray for your campaign and your endeavors that God leads you and follow you all the way. All right, St. Stephen's. Um, we are all here, and I'm going to pass the baton to my sister, Nikki Tandy, who's looking so lovely today. Uh, Nikki's going to give us a little tidbit about what's going on for Women's Month. Good morning, St. Stephen, and happy Women's Month. We are one week away for our annual Women's Day. However, I want to let everyone know that over in the gym, we have a health fair. So after service, go on over to the Family Life Center to the gym because we have vendors and a lot of information and a lot of gifts over there for everyone. So please go over and check out what's going on at the gym. So in six days on Saturday, we will have an empowerment conference. And we need for all the ladies in the building today to rush out to the table when service is over to get your ticket for the Empowerment Conference. Tickets are only $25 for adults, $15 for youth grades 6 through 12. And also, we have our Sunday school. In Sunday school, we are asking for 1,000 women to join Sunday school this week. All right, so we can do it, right ladies? And then on Sunday is our annual Women's Day. All right, yeah. So we will have Dr. R. Janae Pitts Murdoch as our speaker. And she is from Light of the World Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. So please come out, invite all of your family and friends so that we can pack the house out for our Women's Day. And don't forget about the $150 commitment um, above our tithes and offerings. All right. Good morning, St. Stephen Church. Well, I love doing this every time of year. Ladies, make some noise. Woo! It is our month this month. And so, you know, it's we're going to be taking over Wednesday nights, Wednesday nights. And I'm excited to be able to be hosting a uh, night coming up next, this Wednesday, actually, Wednesday, March 13th. If I could get the graphic there on the screen. Uh, me and some phenomenal women are going to show you how God can give you beauty for your ashes. And so it's called the Get Back, How to Reach Your Destination Despite Detours. And some phenomenal women here in our community are going to be sharing their stories. My good friend, Mr. Dr. Monica Hunter, Juanita Rutledge, she's got a phenomenal story. And so we encourage you to join us this Wednesday, 7 p.m., so we can have a wonderful time uh, you know, celebrating sisterhood. And I know a lot of y'all watched all 50 episodes of Risa Tisa yes. share her story. <laughs> so we encourage you to come on out this Wednesday. Let's take a moment. Let's check out this video. Hey, ladies, it's Women's Month. And on Wednesdays, girl, do we have something special planned for you. It's our Wow Wednesdays series kicking off all March long. On Wednesday, March 13th, 7 p.m., it's a candid conversation with me, Crystal Goodner Spratt, The Get Back, How to Reach Destiny Despite Detours, featuring Dr. Monica Hunter, Diamond Alexander, and Juanita Rutledge. Come on out to this ladies' tale all night. And then on Wednesday, March 20th, join us as our beloved Reverend Diane Lewis Johnson will be bringing the word. Wednesday, March 27th, 7 p.m., we're getting sultry. It's the SSC Poetry Cafe, hosted by Cynthia Shelby and featuring women from our church and community. So ladies, make sure you come out and support these events.
And one more thing, ladies, the color for Women's Day next Sunday are shades of blue. So you can do that however you like, light blue, um, navy blue, royal blue. So just make it look good, okay, ladies? <laughs> And I stand representing the youth ministry. The Revival Youth Ministry is led by Xavier Jackson and yours truly, Kelly Bebop. <laughs> Next Sunday, we have a lot going on at St. Stephen that we need to be proud of. Next Sunday, March the 17th, after morning worship, after we have filled the atmosphere with Women's Day, we will be having a youth fellowship in the multi-purpose room. Now, this is to let you know what's going on with our youth ministry and how our young people can get active and can get involved. We need you to RSVP for the food, head count. Don't just show up because you know how it be. So if you don't want to mess with the QR code, give the phone to the baby. Let them set it up for you. <laughs> But if not, I am here. I will be in the vestibule, and I will be taking reservations for next week's fellowship, as well as registering your youth for all the youth activities that we have coming down the pipe. We've got our youth leadership team. We have Sunday school every Sunday. We have the youth choir that's getting up and running. Amen. And then we also have opportunities for our young people to be youth ushers and youth greeters. I have been given $65 to help register young ladies for the Empowerment Conference. And the young ladies, middle school and high school, will have our own separate section, our own separate presenters. So if you have young ladies that want to come and you may not have the means, we have the means. Amen. Bring your young people. Please bring your young people to the youth conference. We don't want no, our guests to come and nobody be home. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless are we going to do the Sunday service? Huh. Oh, All right, this is the part of the service where we encourage you to stand up and greet your neighbor. And while you're doing that, let's go ahead and do our Sunday selfie. Me and the ladies right here are going to do it. And let's go ahead and pass the love. It is his will that every need shall be supplied. St. Stephen Church, it's giving time. It's giving time in the Lord's house, giving time in your house as well. And I so appreciate the giving spirit that we see in the women of St. Stephen Church. Amen? Because watch this, watch this. You, you, can, you can give without loving. You can give without loving, right? But you can't love without giving. 
And so we're celebrating the women of St. Stephen Church, and we do so with that special offering of $150 above and beyond the tithe. You know what? If you just give that in one lump sum, God bless you. If you want to break that up and give that over several weeks, God bless you too. But I, I just want us to, to keep in our hearts the treasure that we have here at St. Stephen Church in the women of this church. Amen? So as we prepare our hearts to give, let's stand all through the worship center. We're going to stand together and then join our hearts together in prayer. You know, here at St. Stephen, you can give... Hi, I'm Lanisha. Proverbs 19.17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Here's how to give at St. Stephen Church. Give online at ssclive.org. Text SSCLive to 833-602-0575. Cash app, dollar sign, SSCLive1. Or you can also mail your check to the attention of the Board of Trustees, address to 1018 South 15th Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40210. God bless you.
joy in our hearts with Women's Month and all the joy that's coming up with, with a celebration with Women's Day and the conference and all, I, I just want to mention, just want to mention that coming up at the end of the month, we've got the, uh, my goodness, we've got Good Friday service. That's going to be the, the service, the seven last words of Christ from the cross. I invite you to come to that. That's going to be at 11 a.m. on Good Friday, which is Friday, March the 29th. And then we want to give a special invitation for our Easter Sunday services. So please be an inviter, right? You know somebody that needs to be here on Easter Sunday and hear a word. And, and, you, and you know, you also know that God is going to put them in your path. And all you have to do, all you have to do is say, come with me. Come with me. Come with me on Easter Sunday. Amen. Sometimes hearts are open and receptive at certain times. And this is one of the times. So, so be bold. Be an inviter. Be an inviter. God is good. And God's, you know, Jesus said, look, my, my house shall be a called a house of prayer for all people. Not just a slice of people, not just a few people, but a house of prayer for all people. And so we come together today recognizing the prayers of the congregation. We certainly want to be lifting up Tony Wilson Browner and his recovery. You recover just a little bit. Of, sometimes God will heal instantaneously. And, that, and that's okay. That's a blessing. Sometimes God uses a process for healing. So, so however God chooses to heal, it's okay with me. Amen? John Best recently had his first treatment. That's part of that process of healing. God, you know, God is with us in the process of healing. Amen? Also, we want to be lifting up the family of Marion, Marion Brooks. Uh, was a greeter and a member of the Over the Hill gang. Uh, she recently passed, so we want to keep her family in our prayers. Jonathan Cosby and, and family, whose mother, Barbara Cosby, recently passed. So we want to keep the family in our prayers. Praying for Janet Williams and praying for, for Deacon Charles Seawright, who's been moved uh, to a nursing home for recovery. For recovery. For recovery. Because God uses a process for recovery. And we want to be praying for his wife, Catherine, as well. Let's now go to the Lord for a time of prayer together. Let's be intercessors. Let's approach the throne of God's grace. So let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come to the foot of the cross because it was at the cross that we first saw the light and the burdens of our heart rolled away. Heavenly Father, we know that you are the God that gives an invitation. You are the God that reaches out to us. You are the God that makes a way where there's no way. You are the God that comes and, and, and says, come, follow me. So, Heavenly Father, we, in our spirits, in our souls, we, we seek to follow you a little bit closer every day. Heavenly Father, we know that you are high and lifted up. 
You are glorious. Your, your, the train of your robe would fill the temple, Lord, as Isaiah said. But even though you are transcendent and high and lifted up, Lord, you are as close as our next breath. You are as close to your, you are the God who sticks closer than a brother. So we thank you, Lord, for your, your transcendence. And we, we thank you, Lord, for your imminence because we know that you are right here by your Holy Ghost moving among us even now. Heavenly Father, some of us came this morning through, uh, through, through heaviness of heart, through a burdened spirit, but we know that you are the inviting God. You say, say, come to me all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, Lord, today we come for the easy yoke and we come for the, the light burden. We know, Lord, that you alone have the power to lift up the downturned head. You alone, Heavenly Father, have the power to give us strength to meet whatever the day will bring before us. You alone, Heavenly Father, have the love that you pour into our hearts that we might be channels of your blessing and pour it into other hearts as well. Heavenly Father, we've named these names in your hearing this day. People who are on our prayer list, prayer concerns for healing, for comfort, for strength, for your grace. But Lord, we bring before you just now uh, those private concerns that dwell within our hearts. Lord, we may have spoken these concerns to no one but you. But you know where we are, you know who we are, and you know where we are headed. So, Lord, give us strength this day. Give us your wisdom and your insight. Give us a, 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 a portion, Heavenly Father, of strength that we might be servants of your will. Lord, we thank you for St. Stephen Church, and we thank you for our pastor. And, Lord, we prepare our hearts just now because we know that you are speaking through our pastor. You're speaking to our pastor, and you are speaking to us through him. So, Lord, help us to receive a, a, a Rima word, a word for this moment, a word for this season, a word for this episode in our lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the thanks, the honor, the, the power, and the glory today and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's say together, amen. 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 God bless you. As worship continues... Um, I've been given charge to give a, just a quick announcement before this pre sermonic selection that, uh, of course, ladies, you know it's Women's Week, and we are looking for you, ladies, to come up here and to be a part of the Women's Day Choir. Amen. So even if you can just hold a note, ladies, come on. We have such a wonderful time. So you have that opportunity to go out here in, in the concourse area at the women's ministry table and sign up. And I give charge also to the men as well. You know, our colors this year are shades of blue, which is the content of God's character. The Bible says that. Amen. And we want you to join in. Do whatever you do. I know there's some UK fans out there. So this is a great opportunity for you to wear your Kentucky blue. But we want this whole sanctuary to be filled with blue next Sunday. Amen. And then in September, when it's men's month, we women will join in and then we'll make this one big congregation, whether it's men's day, women's day, children's day, we're one unified body. Amen. 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 So ladies go out to the concourse area, sign up for the choir, come bring your children, bring your daughters, and we're going to have a wonderful time this year. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Lord, I surrender. Another way of saying that is what? Let go and let God. I surrender. Or Jesus put it another way. What did Jesus say? Thy will be done. Which means what? I got a will. And God has a will. And guess what happens 9% nine, nine of the time? My will conflicts with God's will. And when my will conflicts with God's will, who's win, whose will is supposed to win? Thy will be done. Lord, I surrender. Amen? That was a great song. Amen. And a good song for a great church. Good to see everyone here. Those who you online, God bless your heart. So good you're with us online. And um, all of our guests who are here, and uh, my friend, Brother Joshua Watkins. Would you stand up, my brother? who's running for state rep, <laughs> District 42. He's a, he's a genius. He's a great brother. And we're so glad you're here, my brother, praying for you. Thank you so much for your public service. Amen. Let's give him some love, y'all. <laughs> next Sunday is Women's Day, and we're excited about that, right? We got a great preacher coming here next, next Sunday, y'all. She's bad. She's some, some, some preacher from Indianapolis. Lie of the World Christian Church. So let's come out. Let's go to Sunday school. All right, let's reach that goal of 1,000 people. Get involved. We've got great ministries, uh, not just of the choir and the wonderful ushers. We've got some great greeters. The greeting ministry is so important at St. Stephen Church, right? Amen. Nobody wants to come to a church where folk are mean. Right. All right, so thank God for our greeters, all right? All right, we've been in a series for three weeks, four weeks on the Good Samaritan. No, Cardell, good to see you back there. Good to see you, Cardell. Best cook in America. Amen. We'll get you back in the choir, too, okay? All right, get, get you in the choir. Don't, don't turn your head, Cardell. He's a good brother. Let's give it up for Cardell. That's my man. He loves Barnell. He's very kind of my wife. We've been on the, this journey and looking at the Good Samaritan, right? And they never would call him good, Brother Josh, in his day. Because Samaritans were looked upon with contempt, with stigma, stigmatized. And, uh, but Jesus lifts him up as the quintessential Christian. You know, this Christian thing is not really deep. We make it deep. We make it complex. But if you want to understand the essence of Christianity, just master the story of the Good Samaritan. Because Jesus says if we follow his example... He says that's how, that's the path that leads to eternal life. All right? And we've been looking at this fella. And I'm going to connect him to women today, since it's Women's Month and next Sunday is women. Verse 34 and 35 is the focus for today's message. It says, he, referring to the Samaritan, went to him, referring to the injured man, and bandaged his wounds. Now, he was not carrying bandages. But he took something he had, maybe some cloth, a turban, and he ripped it up and made bandages. Because one of the, the traits and characteristics of love is that love is what Milana Karina calls Kujichakalia. Now, Kumba, Kumba, 
Kumba, creativity. Creativity. So he banished him up with wounds, poured oil and wine, which means he sacrificed his salad, y'all. <laughs> then he put the man on his own donkey, which means he was walking. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, which means he spent at least two days with him. He took out two denarii. It's called denarius. And, a, and, a, and a, a worker would be paid a denarii a day, according to Matthew chapter 20. Which means if he took out two denarii and you were paid a denarii a day for a day's work, that means he gave up two days of pay for a man he did not know and said and, 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 and gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have now let me read the back story John chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 and verse 39. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Then leaving her water jar... The woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, believed in Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Now, if you're reading between the lines, it's apparent that uh, the Good Samaritan and the innkeeper had a pre-existing relationship. When the Good Samaritan took the injured man to the inn, this is not the first time that the Good Samaritan and the, and the innkeeper met. They had a pre-existing relationship because there's no way that an innkeeper would have done for the Samaritan what he did for the Samaritan, nor would there be any way that the Samaritan would have trusted the innkeeper with a blank check if they didn't first know each other, Brother Norman. They knew each other. For example, uh, he, uh, he, he took him to the inn, and according to verse 35, verse 35, it says the next day he took out two denarii, which means when did he pay the bill? On the first day or the next day? The next day, the second day, which means he didn't have to pay up front. Usually, if you're going to stay, you got to pay. No, <laughs> no, no pay, no what? No stay. I had, to, I had the privilege of speaking at a uh, college, an HBCU in South Carolina. Stayed in this nice hotel and then f flew into Nashville. Spoke yesterday for a pastor's banquet. They put me in this real nice Real nice hotel. I thought I was somebody, y'all. <laughs> Everything was paid for. And they said, anything you want to eat, just go up to the seventh floor. They had a nice restaurant, which you look over the city on the seventh floor. And, uh, but when I went in, when I first went into the hotel, brought my bags in, although it was paid for, they said to me, do you have a credit card? <laughs> I 
I said, this is paper. I'm sorry. We need a credit card. They wouldn't give me a key unless I had a credit card. Because they wanted a credit card for incidentals. This innkeeper did not ask the Samaritan for a credit card. Because the text says the next day. So he didn't have to pay to stay because he knew him. And if that don't buttress my argument, let me give you something else that will. And that is, the next day he said, uh, whatever expenses he has, he incurs. When I return, I'll pay for it. So if he needs some more medicine, if he needs some more bandages, if he needs more time in that bed, if he needs some crutches. I don't know what he's going to need. In fact, I don't know how long he's going to be in recuperation. But whatever it is, when I return, I'll pay for it. Which means that the innkeeper, who is a businessman, believes that this Samaritan will do just what he said. And he believes it because he's had some prior dealings with him. But not only does the innkeeper trust the Samaritan, the Samaritan trusts the innkeeper. Because he gave him uh, unrestricted access to his credit card. And said, what, what, whatever expenses he incurs, just put it, put it on my credit card. I'll pay it. Now, you wouldn't do that with your mechanic. You wouldn't say to your mechanic, whatever you see wrong with my car. You don't have to do that to your mechanic, because some mechanics will find things wrong. Do I have a church in here? Every time I get my car fixed, a week later, a light comes on. <laughs> I think, well... But this Samaritan said, here's my credit card, any expenses he incurs, which means he trusted the innkeeper to function with what? Integrity. 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 Integrate. Integrity is the integration of what you say and who you are. And of all the things that you can cultivate to get ahead, the most important attribute you can have, you can develop, is integrity. Whatever you do, protect your name. Protect your reputation. Amen. Because if you're trying to get over, well, that's one thing. But if you're trying to get ahead, have a man integrity from the pulpit to the door. Man was on his deathbed and called his preacher and his lawyer to be right beside him as he was dying. And as they were standing beside him on his deathbed, they said, we are so honored that you brought us to be with you in your last moments. He said, well, I brought you because I wanted to die like Jesus. I wanted to die between two thieves. <laughs> Have integrity. Amen. If you don't got anything else going for you, have Amen in terror. Now, now, usually when we think about this story, we think that the, the, the Samaritan saw the injured man, attended to his wounds, picked him up, put him on his own beast, and then said, well, you know what? I need to take him to an end. But as I read the story, I don't think that's what happened. 
Because the innkeeper said in verse 35, you got to pull it out. He said in verse 35, I will return. I believe that he frequented this inn. And in fact, he was on his way to the inn and just happened to see the injured man on the road as he was on his way as a businessman to the end, traveling through the Middle East. And the reason why Jerusalem, even today, Gaza and Jerusalem is so important is because it is strategically located in the middle of everything. It's the Middle East because it is the intersection between multiple continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and to get to anywhere, you went through the Middle East. It reminds me of the Atlanta airport. <laughs> if I'm going on Delta, I don't care where I'm going. If I'm taking a plane. They're going to say, well, you go through Atlanta, and then you go wherever else you're going. And so here is a businessman, and he stops at the end. But while, his, while he's en route to the end, guess what he sees? He sees somebody beat up, and he says, I'm going to pick him up. The thieves beat him up. The priest and Levite passed him up. He said, I'm going to pick him up, and I'm going to take him to the end with me. One of the great women that you perhaps need to know is Anna Julia Cooper. And Anna Julia Cooper made this phrase famous. She said, Lift as you climb. So as you climb, make sure you help lift somebody else. Say amen in here. God did not give you your race for red bottom shoes. God gave it to you so he could give it through you. Amen? So you can be a blessing so you can what? Lift. Amen? As you climb. Now the thing, I, I, if, 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 if the way I'm reading this story is right, and I, I think I am right, uh, I usually am, <laughs> but if I'm right about this story, and this man is on his road, on the road, with ear pods in his ear, listening to music. And then all of a sudden, while he's listening to music, guess what he hears? Or oh, above the music. Oh, oh, oh. And he had a choice. Will he stop? Or will he ignore it? But the point I want you to get was what happened to him on that road was unscheduled, unplanned, unexpected, unanticipated. And on the road of life, when you're journeying on the road of life, as you're trying to reach some end or some goal, whatever your end may be, you will find while en route, there will be some unscheduled, unplanned, unexpected things that will be on the road that you didn't see coming. You, your life, listen to me, there will come in everyone's life interruptions. And if you're not ready and prepared for interruptions, you're not ready for life. Barnetta and I, we just had a great service on Sunday. Great high time in the Lord on Sunday morning. Monday early, we get a phone call. Is an interruption. They said, rush, get to the hospital quickly. Get to the hospital because uh, your daughter has had a stroke. And it was something that was on the road that we didn't plan, we didn't schedule, we didn't book, and we didn't see coming. And on everybody's road, 
there will be some unscheduled, unplanned, unbooked, unanticipated, unexpected things to happen on every road. And if you're not ready for interruptions, you ain't ready to live life. Because in life, talk to me, somebody. You, you, you got some goal in mind and all of a sudden you go to the doctor and there's a sickness. You attach yourself to somebody that you love with great devotion and they've got cancer. And it was something on the road that God knew was going to happen, but you didn't know was going to happen. And if you're not ready for that, and I don't care how saved you are, I don't care how much you sing in the choir, I don't care how much money you give in church. Stuff happens. Talk to me, somebody. And the question is, what you going to do when you plan to be something where, and then there's an interruption on your road? Now, there's only two responses. You can either handle it resentfully or you can respond resiliently. Uh, amen. When you are resentful, you say, how can I endure this? Some of y'all just enduring. You ain't enjoying, you're enduring. But if you're going to handle it resiliently, you don't endure it, you employ it. So the, the, the wind blows, and when the wind blows, the rooster handles it resentfully and clutches its wings and just shivers. But the eagle does not handle it resentfully. He handles it, what, resiliently. And he don't clutch his wings, he what? And the same wind... Is what what taking him to new heights? Amen, amen. My, I told you my daughter. She had that stroke, and after she had the stroke, and she recovered from it, she said, "I'm gonna know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start a support group for African American stroke survivors, since black people suffer strokes disproportionately." So she started the only black support group for stroke survivors in the country and wrote a book. <laughs> wrote a book. One man, his girlfriend left him. He got so depressed, lost weight, jumped off a bridge and killed himself. Another man, girlfriend, left him. He took out his pen and his pad and wrote one of them somebody done somebody wrong songs. <laughs> ah! And some country music artists got it. And they sung it at the Grand Ole Opera. Man's a billionaire. Because he handled it creatively. He handled it, amen resiliently amen you never know what's getting ready to happen amen on the road of life but I want you to know something else about this story you got to get this and that is because the whole story started because a lawyer said to Jesus um, what is the greatest commandment and Jesus said what do you say and he said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart thy soul thy strength and thy might and love thy neighbor as, as, as thyself. He didn't say love your neighbor instead of yourself. He said love your neighbor what? As yourself. And as is a preposition. And a preposition as means this. Love your neighbor in the same manner that you love yourself. Now the problem is, is that many times if you're not careful 
you're going to end up loving your neighbor more than you love yourself. You cannot love your neighbor if you don't first love yourself. And I'm in the text, y'all, because I know this man, this Samaritan, loved himself uh, because he had a donkey. You ought to have a car. Amen. And that was his means of transportation. And you ought to love yourself, fix your car, get your car. And you ain't being selfish. It's loving yourself. He had some money. You know he had some money. He had bank because he was able to give two denarii. He had clothes. How you know? Because he used bandages. He had connections because he's able to take him to the end with his credit card. In other words, he would not be in a position to bless his neighbor if he didn't first bless. Talk to me, somebody. Because before you can engage in help, help care, you got to first engage in self-care. Amen. 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 Everybody else gets something from you and your stuff is all jacked up. Look at your hair, girl. All messed up nails and you don't take time out for yourself. I take time out for me. Amen. When you're on an airplane, what do they tell you? They say that in the event that there is a decrease in oxygen, oxygen masks will be deployed. First, take oxygen yourself. Then, give it to your dependents. Why? Because if you fall out, you are not in a position to help anybody else. Love your neighbor as, not instead of yourself, not more than yourself. Amen. You got to take care of yourself. You got to get some sleep. You got to go back to school. You got to work on you before you can work on anybody else. Say amen in here. I don't want to apologize for taking care of Kevin Conson. Amen. And you got to be careful because while you're in the process of taking care of other folk, you can become a helpaholic. I'm looking at a whole lot of helpaholics up in this place right now. Some of you Negroes need to be in a 12-step program because you are a helpaholic. He took that man to the end and said, take care of him. Get him back on his feet. And you got to be careful when you're helping folk that you don't make them dependent. In other words, I'm going to help you. You've been injured. You've been injured. And hear me well. Because I told my sister Pamela this. When Pamela was alive. She had all her issues with alcohol. And I told her, I said, Pam, if you're going to get fixed, I said, what happened to you? And some terrible things happened to her. What happened to you is not your fault. But if you're going to get together, it is your responsibility. And if you're waiting for folk who hurt you to help you, you will never get fixed. You got to take the initiative. I know some folk have done you wrong, and you waiting for an apology that ain't coming. You got to, amen, work on yourself. Amen. And what she did, she had her issues, but she tried to work on herself. And, she, and you got to work on yourself. The, the Samaritan can only do so, so much. He can give you the money. But he can't make you get on the treadmill and go through therapy. He can't make you go to the doctors. He, the, he can give the money and pay for the medicine, but he can't make you take it. He can't make you eat right. Because there's some things you got to do for yourself. If I'm hungry, I can eat for you and you'll still be hungry. If I'm you thirsty, I'll drink the water, but you'll still be thirsty. If you sleepy, I can go to bed for you, but you'll still be tired. 
Because there's some things nobody can do for you but yourself. And the problem with many of parents, can I preach? Is that some of you parents are helpaholics. You do for them what they should be doing for themselves. You will say, I will pay your college, but I can't study for you. And I can't send you to class. I can't make you study. I can't make you get up. I can make you act like you got some sense. And some of you parents need to be liberated because you are responsible to your children, but you're not responsible for your children. You're responsible. Amen. They want to act like a fool. You've been injured. You in the end. I don't pay for the end. I don't gave you my oil. I don't gave you my wine. I don't gave you my lunch. I don't gave you my ass. I don't give you everything. Can I preach in here? Can I just keep it real? And you don't want to, you want to lay in bed. You don't want to take the medicine. You've been injured. You got to go with the medical protocol. That means you have to get up. You have to walk. Christina's walking right now. She's walking. She's doing, but she had to get up. Amen. If, if, if I kept paying or if I kept, you know what Charles Nance told me, Norman? Charles Nance. Charles Nance, our security guard. Charles Nance said, he said when I went to see him after he had his accident, I went to see Charles Nance. He said, Pastor, do you know what they told me when I first came in here? He said to me, they told me, we don't feed you here. I said, what do you mean you don't feed me here? I'm going to starve. They said, no, we're going to put the food on a tray and put it in front of you with a knife and a fork. But we ain't going to take the fork, pick up the food, and put it in your mouth because we don't feed you here. And he got mad at first. They won't feed me. He has to find a way to bring the chicken to his mouth. And the green bean, if he's going to eat. And Charles said there were days he had jello on his face and chicken in his ears. And y'all ain't hearing me. And it seemed like they were being cruel. But the cruel thing to do was to do for him what he could do for himself. Be See, some of y'all parents are cruel. You ought to tell them, I don't feed you here. I'm going to give you what you need. And that is why Charles Nance is on his way back. He's on his way back because they made him do it. And some of y'all saying, well, I don't want my kids to have to go through what I went through. <laughs> Not realizing that the reason you are the woman and the man you are is because you went through what you went through. Do I have a church in here? But let me close. Because I told y'all this had to do with women. And you say, the worst, where's the women in the story. I don't see the woman in the story. Where well, it's the background. Because this Samaritan man first was introduced to Jesus by a woman. Because when Jesus went through Samaria and saw the woman at the well, she dropped her water pots and she went back and told everybody, come see a man who's told me everything I've done. And the Bible says that the entire town believed on Jesus because of the testimony of the woman, which means this Samaritan got to know Jesus because a woman told him. 
and, and that's why I love this poem. Let me give it to you. This poem says, I calculate I've been around as much as anybody observing the wings of folk. And after pretty careful study, it's my conclusion that while men are secure about all the credits due them, the women as a rule don't always get the praise that should be coming to them. Just take the leaders one by one, and they will tell you in one way or other the strength that helped them win their place was borrowed from their mother. If truth is ever known of how they got so noted, a lot of statutes built for men would be rebuilt and petticoated. I don't maintain women folk are perfect, and I never said it, but I believe they're doing some things for which some men are getting credit. And when you see a monument with some man's figure up above it, you can rest assured that some woman is at the bottom of it. <laughs> and why you didn't know, you know about the Good Samaritan, but it was the woman. And that's why he was acting like a woman. The Samaritan was not acting like men. Because men want to cover up their, they want to hide their emotions and their vulnerabilities. About a month and a half ago, I messed up my back. I was in serious pain. And about three weeks into, two weeks into my pain, I had to fly out with Barnetta to go to Memphis, go to Orlando. And she said to me, because, see, this, this Samaritan is, is doesn't mind saying, I need some help. He went to the innkeeper and said, I need some help. That's not how men think. Men don't want to be vulnerable and say, we need help. Especially if it's a woman. No, uh-uh. It's not being a man. Men don't cry. Men Tough it out. That's how men have been wired up. Be, you're like John Wayne, buddy. If John Wayne gets shot, I'm a pilgrim, brother. I didn't hurt. Man. That's how I've been wired up. So my back is killing me. I couldn't come to church. I miss church, y'all. And my back is killing me. We in the airport got to go all the way down. But there's this cart, this driver who takes elderly people. And Barnetta says, son, Kevin, do you want to? I said, you mean to tell me you, you, gonna, you think I'm going to get on this car? I ain't going to need no help. I don't need no help. You going to help? Uh-uh, I'm strong. And I'm doing this all the way because I don't got enough humility to say I need some help. And then when it comes time, when the bags come off the carousel, for the very first time ever, in almost 45 years of being married, she said, oh, I'm usually gets it, but I couldn't bend over and get to be. <laughs> and she's sitting there saying, let me get it for you. And I'm looking around to see if anybody's watching. <laughs> and I still haven't got over that. I need some therapy right now. because. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that the Samaritan was really doing breaking this myth of, of boot, bootstrapism and rugged individualism and saying, you know what, I need somebody. I'm not so masculine that I don't need to find an innkeeper. And you shouldn't be so strong and so hallelujah and so saved that you're not going to need somebody to help you. You may have, listen to me, an aging mother, aging father, and you take them in the home. You try your best to help them. But you may need to get help with an innkeeper. You may need some help with your parents as they age. Now, notice he says, I'm going to return, which means you don't put them in the nursing home and leave them. you got to return because they treat your parents and loved ones based on how frequent you come back to check on them. <laughs> come on, say amen in here. But on the road of life, some of y'all going to leave here. You don't know what's going to happen. 
That's why you ought to enjoy the moment. Live. Listen to me. All you got is right now. Enjoy the moment because you never know what's getting ready to happen. You never know what's going down the road. But regardless of what's happening on the road and whatever comes on your road, listen to me. I'm through. Handle it with resilience, not with res resistance and resentment. Ask, Lord, how can I employ this, not how can I endure this? And you'll see that the Lord will do some amazing things. And some of you are saying, well, preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm dead broke. Well, you can even find out what God can do with a dead broke Negro. Now, some of you are saying, well, preacher, I don't have any connections. I don't have an in. I don't have a friend. Nobody's coming around to pick me up. You keep trusting God because you can even find out there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Some of y'all saying, well, pastor, you know what I'm going through? Because I've been stabbed in the back. Well, that means you still in front of them. You still in front of the person because if they stabbed you in the back, that means they still behind you. You still ahead. That problem that I had, I just couldn't seem to solve. I tried and I tried, but I kept getting involved. I turned it over to Jesus, and I stopped worrying about it. I turned it over to the Lord, and he worked it out. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care what comes on your road. If you turn it over to Jesus, he will work it out. Do I have a witness in here that he will? Won't he work it out? Is there anybody who can holler, yes, he will? He will work it. Work it out. Amen. Let's stand all over this room. Praise the Lord, what a mighty word from God. As our decision counselors come this morning and our deacons, if you believe God can work it out, why don't you come this morning and give your life to Christ and make the St. Stephen Church your home, amen? Or if you need prayer, come down this morning because God is a God that is able to do all things but fail, and he can. Has he worked it out for anybody in here before? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you testify? The woman at the well had a testimony. What's your testimony? Can you just turn to your neighbor and tell them what God did for you very quickly? Don't take long. Amen. Would you come this morning? As our choir leads us, would you come this morning?
still time to come. That's a good line right there, choir. If my storage is empty, then I'm available to you, God, who can fill me back up. Hallelujah. the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you didn't feel like coming now, we'll be here after the service and you can still come. It's still an opportunity also to give your tithes and offerings. If you missed the offertory appeal, there are um, receptacles right outside of the sanctuary doors. You can still give and you can still give through those other five ways that we're able to give offering. Amen. I have a few things that I want to bring before you. Maddie's kitchen is open today. Can somebody say hallelujah? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I do want to mention as a reminder that the women's choir rehearsals are this week. So you want to come to the choir rehearsals. Amen? Amen. And Sister Erica said if you can just hold a tune. What if you can't hold a tune? Just come on anyway. <laughs> so come on to the women's choir. And two have united with the church. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all. We can do better than that. Hallelujah. The angels in heaven are shouting. Somebody gave their life to Christ. Amen, amen, amen. And we also want to remind you that the women's health fair is going on in the Family Life Center in the gym. Please make your way over there. It's a lot of great opportunities to get good information. And then I heard something about some gifts. Y'all know we like gifts. So run on over there and get your gift at the, the health fair. Amen. One final announcement. Uh, it was announced today that Sister Marion Brooks, one of our dear, dear greeters, uh, passed away. But actually, she thank God she's still here. She's very ill. So let's keep her in prayer. It's an opportunity to pray for her. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. If there's nothing else that requires our attention, we'll go ahead and close out the service in prayer. Our Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for the reminder today. To be a good Christian means we have to have some compassion and some empathy, oh God. But first and foremost, we have to have an endearing love for you, God. We have to know that you love us with an everlasting love. And because you love us so much, oh God, we can love others as we love ourselves. Thank you, God, for that word today. We ask you to continue to bless our pastor. Bless the St. Stephen Church, oh God. Shower your love upon us and your grace upon us, oh God, and your mercy upon us as we depart this place, yet never from your presence, God. Be with us, go with us, strengthen us, stand by us and keep us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Can we say in agreement, church? Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Hug somebody. <laughs>